your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Mary Mid, everybody, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. I hope you're all safe and healthy and ready for a little cauldron stirring. My guest tonight is author Linda Radish, and um, she's a professional craft instructor, paper crafter, and eclectic writer. She's the author of Night of the Witches and The Old Magic of Christmas, as well as numerous articles on folklore and herb lore and ancient religions. And she's here tonight to talk about her latest book, The Lore of Old Elfland secrets from the bronze age to middle earth and as always questions and comments are welcome so if you're in the para x chat room send me a private message and um you know you can put it in regular chat but it usually is quite active and i kind of miss it so if you do put it there and i don't get back to you send it to me in private or just you know send it in capital letters in the chat room and hope nobody's put their foot on the gas um but anyway, um, if you're not here, though, you can join us at paraxradionetwork.com. And um, we don't bite. We have a good chat room. So, yeah, come come join us. In the meantime, Linda, you've been waiting patiently. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And I love your theme. Oh, thanks. The music. Yeah, who, who did that? I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, it, it, it's on YouTube, and it's and they they say it's just the witch's chant or something, and and it's all over the place. But somebody in chat, um, MJ, he knows it by heart, and so he just as it was going today, he typed it into the chat room. Because <laughs> I mean, oh, really? it is it is a chant, so you know, I mean, you you know, you don't not a lot of words to remember, but it, it it's got a good feeling. So thank you for liking it. And um, I liked your book. Um, very interesting. I mean, you write of folk tales and stories and recipes and crafts from the land of the elves and fairies. Um, when and how did your interest go in that direction? Um, well, like a lot of people with Tolkien, but um, as a kid, I was a very poor reader. I wasn't a poor reader, Um I think part of my problem was that um, I liked to read and I read every word. Um, so I was put in the slow reading group, so that wasn't really encouraging. Um, and also, um, my sister would read one book after another. I would start five books and not finish any of them. Mm. Um, and I actually saw the, the Rankin-Bass cartoon version of The Hobbit before I ever read it. It was after we all, in the, um, in the 70s, mm-hmm. on TV. And after that, my mom bought us The Hobbit, the book, in mm-hmm. mass market paperback, yep. and which, of course, my sister just devoured. And um, we took it on a trip to Germany with us that summer when we were going to visit relatives. And um, when she finished it, she passed it to me, and I started it. And I think, and I was doing well. I was really into the dwarves at the time, the first time I didn't finish it. Um, and I think I dropped out at the the big battle scene. That was just, mm-hmm. I'm not much for battle scenes. And <laughs> I, I gave up on it after that. Um, but the, the cool thing was where I was reading it. Um, I have very vivid memories of uh, my, my grandmother. We would 
go every other summer when I was a kid to visit my grandmother in northern Germany, and she would um, always book a trip for us. I would have been perfectly happy staying in the city and going to the bakery and the candy store every day. Yeah. Uh, watching your <laughs> TV. Yeah, Legoing, because we always got Legos, because they were harder to get in the 70s. They were harder to get in the U.S. We would always get Legos. But she's like, no, we have to take a trip. Um, so she would take us on these these trips where it's a so so you get the the bus ride you go somewhere with a group on a bus and it's really cheap because you have to sit through a testimonial mm. so she would we never buy the stuff but i remember sitting through um you know like ginseng tea testimonials and <laughs> sheep wool pillow testimonials and it, uh, like all in german and at that mm. time i didn't speak german um so anyway one of our trips um, we went to a town called Bad Bevensen, um, where they have mineral baths. And, oh, oh it's all seniors on the bus. Of and course. Mineral baths, it was all <laughs> seniors bobbing around in the water. Um, but I remember we had the, the Hobbit with us, and it was this little vac- vacation apartment that had a wardrobe. Because in Germany, they don't have closets. They have wardrobes. And this it was old. It was dark wood. And I would sit in there and leave the wardrobe doors open just enough for the light to shine in and I was sitting in there reading The Hobbit Mm. and there was a forest um, a big conifer forest that we hiked through very dark and I remember my sister and I I I don't know which one of us said hey what this reminds me of and the other one said Mirkwood so yeah so it began with The Hobbit I didn't finish it I, I didn't either. I didn't. I think, uh, just admit it. I did that. finally finish it with, I'm trying to remember, uh, my kids are 14 years apart, so you would think I would remember which was which. I know I read it cover to cover with my, my younger one. I think my older one, we listened to it on audio. So I've, mm. I've since finished it. I've since been back and I read my favorite parts. And um, as I got older, it was, I mean, I still love the dwarves. Um, but the elves were capturing my imagination a little bit more as I got older. And um, it was also in Germany. I was at my uncle's house, and um, he's got a ton of books. And he had a lot um, on the Bronze Age, the Bronze Age culture of that part of Germany. And looking at the pictures, I thought, well, it's, you know, this is kind of like elvish stuff. Mm-hmm. And kind of made that connection that, you know, where did we... Where did our concept of elves, not, I'm, I'm, and I'm talking about like pre-industrial revolution, not like the little tiny people that we think of now when we think of, you know, Chris, Christmas elves in the workshop or little right. tiny people, yeah. um, but that earlier concept of elves, that, you know, the tall, glittering elven prince, and and I think that it started with the, the Bronze Age elite because there was a brief golden age up in northern Germany, Denmark, uh, southern Sweden, southern Norway, um, that it shared. It was the same cultural sphere. It had a brief golden age with uh, a small elite who had lots of cool stuff and, you know, gold and bronze jewelry. And I think that's where that initial concept of the elf may have, have like, cemented itself. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and also, you know, the stories of the elven tribes um, have been told throughout history. I mean, I don't know how far back, but I imagine almost forever, um, because every country and every, you know, um, every buddy has grown up, no matter every what you are. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. culture, um, that was Australia, the Yeah, Australia, you know, the Americas, Japan, Everybody has elves. Everybody always has somebody that came before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, so where was old Elfland, and and how did it? I, I guess I really am curious about the genesis in general. You know, um, but I guess maybe it's been told mouth to mouth to mouth all the way down the generations. But is there like one particular time in history that? All of a sudden, the interest in elves and, and things appeared, or or 
or is it just something that everybody um, always knew of? Yeah, I think I think there's always been a belief in elves. I think there's always been um, a thought, you know, like, well, we're we're here, even even the Icelanders when there really hadn't been much of anybody there. There had been some Irish monks there. Um, there had been some Inuit hunters would would come seasonally and then leave again, but nobody actually, no humans actually living there long term. Um, but when the Icelanders came, they perceived there to be elves and and you know elemental beings already in the landscape. And they have Iceland now has one of the most interesting, diverse and and strongest beliefs in elves. And it's it's a mainstream thing, like you know that you get an elf an elf whisperer in before you build a road. So I think there's always a need to think that there was somebody, somebody there before, and usually there was somebody there before because, you know, there's one population is there, builds things, cultivates the land, and then for whatever reason climate change moves off and then another culture comes in, sees these, the ruins, and think, well, who did that? Who who built those? And once you naturally, uh, the human imagination makes up stories. And in the in uh, northern Europe, um, the Stone Age peoples, the new Stone Age peoples, built these really um, big. You know, they had grave sites that had large stones. It had you know some had boulders, um, some were lined with stones. So it was something like, wow, it must be giants. Mm-hmm. Who, <laughs> up and um, there's a fine there's actually a fine line in in Norse mythology between the giants and the elves I have a chapter in the book um, that sort of delineates the members the different sort of ethnicities in elf kind and there's a lot of overlap because um, yeah. the giants in North mythology they weren't stupid they were they were clever they were sly they were often very attractive and um, they were known to, to do magic in fact there's even sort of a suggestion in one of the old Norse poems that the the world as we know it is just an illusion created by the giants. Mm. Kind of like yeah. that. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we're talking about, you know, everybody growing up hearing about elves and fairies. And I think the way that you were introduced to them is kind of the way that you think because um, – When I was really young, a well-meaning relative gave me an elf doll that scared the bejesus out of me. I mean, it was mean-looking. It had a beard and a cap. And, I mean, I was afraid it was going to come up and, you know, eat my face in the middle of the night, I swear. (laughs) I mean, it was really scary. And it wasn't until I read The Hobbit that I decided that not all of these creatures were out to get me. (laughs) So... I mean, I don't know. If it, I, I think it, it, it's a generational thing because, you know, kids today, like somebody in the chat room just said, elf and elf in the shelf. They know that. Um, but there's also, you know, um, years ago, and I don't even remember this, but Mary Tyler Moore started her career for I think it was a brand called Hot Point, and she played an elf danced around you know those old black and white commercials she was whatever and so Ah. here's mary tyler moore the elf was a a kitchen thing hot point was something in the kitchen yeah like a range or something like that and i forget yeah i forget her name in it but she was something and she was because she was a dancer she was this dancing happy little smiling elf so maybe people (laughs) thought elves were female and danced and they were happy um so yeah i think um I think everybody was introduced to the elven um, concept as something that they maybe read in a book or, you know, and it was a good elf. There was a happy elf, but then there was, you know, something else that, because it, I mean, elves are in the genre of fairies and, you know, other little, um, um, not little necessarily, but other creatures. So, yeah, you, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, we, and anybody. Mhm. So you know. Yeah, it, just like any. I use elf, elf and fair. I just chose for the book. I chose elf because it's a, a word of Germanic origin, and that's most. Yeah. This is mostly you know the Germanic realm, um, but it is the same thing as a fairy. Yeah, and you know people, as I've talked about on the show lots of times, um, people 
some people think that all fairies are tinkerbells. They don't really they don't realize the big, huge, mean ones that you do really don't want to mess with, as opposed to pixie dust. Dust, sorry. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, I think I think the yeah, concept- they're dangerous. They can be dangerous. There's that yeah, which makes them all the more interesting. Yeah, as long as you're not dealing with them. They are interesting. It's good to hear stories about them. But, you know, but you know, you're talking about Tolkien, and, and I just mentioned The Hobbit. But, you know, that book was first published in, I think, 1937. 1937, right. And it was very well, well received by the public. I think it picked up some awards in the best juvenile fiction category. And it's never been out of print. But somehow it did really totally explode in a good way in the 60s and the 70s when you know we all had to have it otherwise we were not cool we had to read Tolkien we had to read The Hobbit um, and and that I think is it brought um, it into the mainstream in a very big way and then in you know the late 1990s Harry Potter's Dobby the house elf brought them back again and then once again, you know, when when Peter Jackson did the movie, The Hobbit and, and Lord of the Rings and everything. Oh, I, I I didn't like Peter Jackson's. I I um, I, my son and I started watching it on DVD several years ago, and you know, as soon as it came out, and we we just we jumped off. We didn't we didn't continue. Um, I he was putting in. Um, and he was like putting parts of the Cimmerillion into the Hobbit, uh-huh. and and to me, like the Hobbit is a ch- it is still a children's story. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And I, I he didn't treat it that way. I didn't like it. I wanted to like it because I really like Aiden Carter, who played, I think Keeley, one of the mm-hmm. elves. Mm-hmm. I'm like, Dang, yeah, and I just couldn't stick with it. I'm and we have seen the other Lord of the Rings movies, the Peter Jackson, um, multiple times. Because mm-hmm. uh, my daughter was totally into them, and like any time there's nothing to do, we would be watching Lord of the Rings. Yeah, um, but yeah. But it's just—it it's just seems like that. every every generation has a new introduction to people. I mean, also uh, the Game of Thrones. You know, they all have um, a, a mention of elves, and people are of every age are learning either them. Right from the get-go, that's the first thing that they've ever known about it. Or maybe, you know, it's just a different interpretation of an elf. But but elf and elf and life goes on. I mean, it it's and it, yeah. and it always will. And I think it's interesting that in Harry Potter they get small again. The house elves are small again. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know that also you know took so she kind of dialed them dialed them back. Um, Let's go back to the small elves, and they're they're just as interesting. My favorite was Creature. Oh yeah, um, one of my characters <laughs> in the whole series. Oh my god, he was Especially so good. And the way they refer to themselves in the third person. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Dobby needs socks or clean clothes or whatever. Yeah, I mean it, it, it's very yeah. cute. But uh, I mean, oh my cat has come to join us. <laughs> I just like that. They're always in the mainstream now. It's not something like certain things that are spoken behind closed doors and not brought up, you know, um, and, and not looked at as a negative way necessarily. And I think that's really important. Um, all right, so so elves and fairies are one and the same. You write that in the book, but there is a difference yeah. between fairy tales and folk tales, right? Yes. Um. Fairy tales take place in a kingdom far away, and usually there's a prince or a princess or a king and a, a queen, and it's it's distance. It's in a you know mythical realm. It's not kind of this world. Mm-hmm. Folk tales are very much this world. Usually, it will tell you what village or what province. It's taking place, and you know it's that stone over there, and it's usually this was in my grandmother's time. There are people are named in there, and it's usually it's it's fairy maids and and cowherds, actual people like working class people mm-hmm. who these things are happening to. But it, it's they're no less otherworldly because in the folk tales. Um, 
there's an encounter with the supernatural. We're not mm-hmm. in a mythical kingdom, but we're mm-hmm. encountering someone who comes from a different world or a different realm. Mm-hmm. And there's usually, I, I like the ones that have like, I love my favorite folk tales, the, the elf, elf-related folk tales are the ones where there's some physical object, um, either a, a bridal crown, which is, bridal crowns aren't for royalty. They're in um, Sweden and Norway, uh, they're worn traditionally. A bride wears a special crown, um, mm-hmm. either bronze or brass. Or I've even seen um, one time I was at the Santa Fe Folk Art Museum, and there was a, a Swedish wedding scene, and uh, it was made out of like could even have been chocolate wrappers, <laughs> soft flowers, and, and gold gold foil. And um, so yeah, there's one there's one with a crown, and I. Before I had really kind of narrowed it down to the Northern European, um, to to Northern Europe, I had really wanted to include um, the story of Urashi Mataro um, from Japan um, because that's, uh, there's a box in it. And often the, the, the Japanese folk tales will tell you at the end, like, oh, in this box, you can still go to this village in Japan, the seaside village, and this box is in the temple there. And um, there's a story where he goes, it's not Elfland, but he's a fisherman, and he goes to a land beyond the sea, and he lives there for a while. A few years, he's very happy, but then he wants to go home and visit, and he's given a box. And they say, you know, don't open the box while you're there, or you won't be able to come back. And, of course, he opens the box and he immediately ages 300 years because that's how long he's been gone and he drops dead, which is very similar to a, there's an Irish um, myth where that happens to a character. Uh, but then at the end it tells you, you know, the box is there. And, and there's, this, um, there's a Japanese story about a, a brass kettle that could turn into a tanuki that's like a badger and you can still see this kettle in this temple um so i really like it when there's physical things like a spoon um yeah. there's one story in the book about these these spoons that the elves left in behind in payment for the the beer that they had drunk after they um tied up all the farmers uh sheaves <laughs> so yeah, folk tales fairy tales are you know up on a cloud somewhere folk tales are Nitty gritty, relatable, probably relatable. Very yeah, very relatable yeah. to the people who were telling them. So that I think that even increased the elvish phenomenon because if you're if you're hearing people are telling you about the time that someone they knew ran into an elf in that forest that that's right there where you live, and you, the next time you walk through that forest, if you see a shadow or you see a tree out of the corner of your eye, you're more likely to think that that's an elf. And then you have your own story to tell. And so it kind of makes it stronger. Yeah. It's, again, relatable. That's important. And if you can pick up one thing that you can relate to, it opens the whole thing out. There's no, you know, no room for doubt. Because the imagination takes over. You know what's going on. And, and yeah, relatable is good. (laughs) Yeah, so yeah. the book also, I mean, you not only tell tales of the ancient lore, but you also include things like recipes and crafts and even elven and elven herb, herbal. Say that three times fast. And um, <laughs> we'll definitely cover all that ground. But let's begin with the tales. I mean, like I grew up with fairy tales, but I don't recall being told or reading anything about elves until The Hobbit. Um and my guess is, for example, that kids in the UK grew up with the Mapanogian. Um Here in the States, it was Grimm's fairy tales, basically. And, and more likely, um, the Nordic and Scandinavian countries grew up with more of the elven tribes, right? Yeah, well, um, so we had a big... I When I was growing up, I thought we had this big, red, fat book of fairy tales. And I always thought it was Grimm's fairy tales. Um, but when I actually looked at the title when I started reading them to my kids, um, it was actually World's Best Fairy Tales. Ah. And there were some, yeah, there were some of them were grim, um, but some of them, you know, they were from all over the world. Mm-hmm. And um, 
there was a story in there, Snow White and Rose Red. Have you heard of that one? Yes, yes. That where that has a um, angry dwarf in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was my mother read that one to us a lot. Uh, so I I mostly grew up with dwarves because in um, Germany the dwarves got the upper hand at some point. So a lot of things that you see the elves doing in the other countries you have dwarves doing in Germany. And if you go back to the medieval literature, um, like the giants, often you know, some of them are said to be quite beautiful. Um, there's a beautiful dwarf woman who appears in in one medieval poem. And uh, often, often the thing with the dwarves, if, if they could cast a glamour on themselves to look very nice, but their natural state was not so nice. Mm-hmm. And, but like elves, they would live, um, were thought to live inside rocks. Um, another, yes, the, are they, I guess they're dwarves. I grew up with the Heinzelmännchen, um, mm. which were, I, I would, I have to find out if, if they were based on a folk belief. I think they probably were. There was some guy, um, in Cologne, Germany wrote this long poem about the Heinzelmännchen of, Cologne and how they were they were little people who came every night mm-hmm. and did all the work mm-hmm. while the people were sleeping and uh, then they left in the morning and the people were perfectly happy because they didn't have to do any work but of course and it's always a woman mm-hmm. some woman decides she wants to find out who's who's doing the work so she leaves um, dried peas on the stairs so when the Heinzelmann team come up the stairs they they fall down and make a lot of noise and she wakes up and she goes and she sees them and of course that was it. They never come back. Um, <laughs> Great alarm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, but I mean, yeah, it was her fault. That, and so now the people yeah. of Cologne, just like everybody else, they've got to get up and, and do their work. And I also grew up with the Meinzelmännchen mm. who are, so the Heinzelmännchen are traditional. The Meinzelmännchen are these, these little guys, they've changed I've looked them up recently, and they they changed them. They now are are um, they used to always have they all had um, black eyes, black hair, but you would only see little tufts of the hair sticking out from under their caps. They were these, mm. these little um, another word in English, them that's a little cap with a peak, a sort of falling down peak on it. Um, okay. Yes. And so they were called Meinzelmännchen. It's a take on Heinzelmännchen because. They are the mascots of the public television station in Germany that is broadcast from the city of Mainz. Mm. And um, loved them when I first went to Germany because they would come on um, in in the middle of the show. They would have a little spot. And, and the Mainz, they would just do these little cartoons. They didn't talk. So I liked that because they didn't speak German. They just spoke, um, they made little noises. Uh, so you didn't need language to understand the action. Mm-hmm. And and to get a little rubber Meinzelmännchen doll, my sister and I could pick one out each every time we went to Germany. Um, mm-hmm. And their purpose was, I only found this out later, because it was a public TV station, they had to make, they have to make a clear distinction between what is the broadcast, the program, and what is advertisements. Mm. So they would the Meinzelmännchen to divide, okay, this is not the program now, this is the advertisement, then you see Meinzelmännchen again, that means we're going back to the program. Um, and nice. they're still very popular. They have some red-haired ones now, which I, I can and sometimes they take their, their caps off, which to me is just like blasphemous. If you're Meinzelmännchen, don't you take your cap off? But <laughs> um, the first time we went to Germany, I was six, and we stayed um, with my grandmother, and the first time that I met my my two cousins, uh, one of them one of them was a year younger than me, and you know I was looking forward to going to meet my cousins for the first time. And they came to the door, and instead of like, you know, saying hi or he's looking at me, my oldest cousin Alex, he just makes he runs for the kitchen. Mm. Like, what? Runs for the kitchen and he opens the cabinet door, and I'm like, what? And um, my grandmother explained that the Meinzelmännchen, which in olden times probably would have been the Heinzelmännchen, but because we were modern mm-hmm. 70s kids, it was the Meinzelmännchen would leave treats for him inside the cabinet. 
Mm. So he had to go and check out, he was only five, he had to go check out what the mindful mentions had left, you know, chocolate and stuff. Mm. And I, I, at the time, I didn't believe that the, mm-hmm. the mindful mentions were coming into the apartment and, and leaving chocolate. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I was miffed that they hadn't left any for me. <laughs> so, like, I didn't believe, but I kind of did believe. Mm-hmm. Well, we want to, I think. Yeah, I think I'm still, I'm still in that place. To yeah, this day. me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to go to a quick break. When we come back, I mean, we're going to talk about much more about the book and stuff. But I want you to um, talk about the tale of the gloaming gray, about Sir Bosmer and the elf maid, because that kind of reminded me of Thomas the Rhymer and the Fairy Queen. And it's it's kind of a very sweet little story. So if you don't mind, um, maybe you can do that. And um, meanwhile, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. And like I said, we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about recipes, crafts, elven herbal. So guys, don't wander off too far. Stirring the Cauldron will be right back. So don't go away. If you end up with webbed feet, remember, you've been warned. warned. Explore the second edition of the Witch's Oracle deck through 45 innovative cards and enhanced guidebook that peers into the world of the witch. The deck's stunning artwork has a new look and includes seven brand new inspirational cards. Each card now includes a suggested crystal or gemstone to enhance your reading as well as a magical incantation that provides energy, reinforces the card's meaning, and helps the desired message to be sent out into the universe. The easy-to-navigate guide also has a new look and offers straightforward, gentle guidance that takes readers through both good times and bad. And now includes a chapter on crystal and gemstone divination by the amazing Nicholas Pearson. The Witch's Oracle. It is a perfect divination deck for witches as well as non-pagans and is designed to suit both seasoned readers and beginners alike. Find out more about the Witch's Oracle deck at www.marlabrooks.com and you can purchase the deck from shifferbooks.com, amazon.com, or order a copy from your favorite bookseller. You've no doubt heard of Tango and Cash, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Perhaps it takes two to tango. Well, now, on the first and third Thursdays of each month, there's a show called Tango and Friends at 8 p.m. Eastern on the Para-X Radio Network with your host, Bruce Tango. And yes, there will be at least two to tango on each episode, sometimes even more. There's going to be lots of topics and lots of guests you'll all know and lots of surprises. Prizes. Tango and Friends, every first and third Thursday of the month at 8 p.m. right here on the Para-X Radio Network. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hello, and welcome back. And um, my guest tonight, for those of you who have come in late, is Linda Radish. And we are talking about her book, The Lore of Old Elfland. And before the break, um, I kind of maybe twisted her arm a little bit. Um, but I love the story of the gloaming gray. So could you kind of give us your version of it? Okay, yeah. This is a, a story about an elf and some fatal, as um, many of them are, because uh, usually in human elf, encounters when there's a sexual dimension it usually does not go well for the human um and it does go both ways there are elven gentlemen luring um human girls and elven women uh luring human human boys and men and um this one's interesting because and it's from it's from Denmark and we know about it mainly because there was a ballad called Sir Bosmer in Elfland and um in this case the elf maid uh, had her eye on him for for years, for several years, um, before she made a play for him. And it's clear that she lives in the water. Uh, and uh, one da- day she had to uh, go and visit him um, at home. And uh, the way... Uh, so the, bad- the ballad is from the... 12th 
century. Um, the way households, large households were set up is that um, people would sleep often in sort of like little cabins, um, mm-hmm. not, not the main hall where, where you would eat, but in little cabins that would have um, their own doors. And that, that happens a lot, that the, the elf woman will come scratching at that outside door. And often people didn't sleep alone. Um, so he's, he's got somebody, somebody where it's not clear, maybe a brother um, sleeping in, in the, the chamber with him when she comes to the door and she kind of like, she plays with his hair and uh, says, hey, come, come meet me at the bridge tomorrow night. And whoever was sleeping with him said, don't go, don't do it, man, don't, do, don't go. Uh, but of course he goes and uh, his horse throws a shoe as he's crossing the bridge but that was all part of her plan. Uh, Sir Bosmer falls in the water, and when he falls in the water, he is in Elfland. He's now in in her realm. And uh, we we wish that the 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 balladeer had given us a little more description of what her hall looks like. Um, but it seems to be pretty much what you would expect of a medie- medieval Danish hall. And she gives him something to drink. He he drinks it and no longer remembers. You know, he, he had a fiance back in Denmark. He no longer remembers her. Um, and what's interesting is he no, no longer speaks uh, what they refer to as the tongue of Earth. He now speaks the tongue of Elfland, mm-hmm. which is interesting to me, this idea that the elves would have a different language. Um, because, one, there's one theory, um, which is to me is, like, really interesting. I, I think it's only maybe true to a small degree that the elves were based on um, not the people who were already gone from a new land, but the people who were still there. Mm-hmm. So when you have, say, you have um, farmers moving into northern Europe where there are only hunter-gatherers, they might have perceived the hunter-gatherers as a different race, a different species. Um who, of course, spoke in a different language. And then, then you had it all over again um, when you have the, the new Stone Age farmers are settled in, but then uh, new people move in with metalworking and horses, and they would have had a different language again and perceived the other as maybe something supernatural. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I wonder if it's... So I think this sort of culture clash comes down through these these stories, and um, yeah, she says, tell me in the tongue of earth what land bred thee and gave thee birth, and at first the Brosner says Denmark, and then he has a drink, and then he says, oh, I'm from Elfland. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of sad, because uh, he, he does not get to go home. He stays there and doesn't remember his family or his, his home. Mm-hmm. Which begs and, the question: um, How do we know? How do we know what happened to him to write write down the ballad <laughs> if he never came home? <laughs> exactly. But it, uh, those are fun yeah. stories. I mean, Thomas the Rhymer only got stuck for seven years. He came back. Um, <laughs> but yeah, then he got it. how much time had passed? Had it only been seven years on the outside? I think it wasn't so. a Rip Van Winkle type of situation. No, uh-uh. it? no, oh, okay. no. Okay. He he so didn't. That's seven years. That's seven. Yeah, well, he, he just got lucky. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. okay, let, let's talk a little bit about some of the crafts and, and some of the other things in the book. Like, in every chapter, you have a spell break. Now, what is a spell break? Well, the spell break is um, where, I, where I have stuck the relevant folktale for that chapter. And, yeah, I did kind of toy with, like, what should I, what should I call it? And it's not just... Um, I'm not just retelling the folktale because that would be boring and I do direct you for each one where I found the folktale. So if you want to read, um, you know, just the tale as it was recorded either in the ballad or by the ethnographers, there were these in the 1800s in Europe, there were these traveling ethnographers beginning with the Grimm's, but then there were many of the, as, as Bjornsson was in, let's say, Norway, um, a lot of people rambling, scholars rambling around the countryside, interviewing the peasants and writing down all the stories that they knew. So there's lots of collections. And that's where I got um, 
stories in the book. Um, but what's, what I've done is I've told you basically what happens in the story, and then I pick it apart, um, you know, what I think is going on behind the scenes. Um, and so I decided to call it a spell break because um, it's, it's not a spell as we think of a spell. Mm-hmm. Um, but in Old English, spell and story were the same thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah. to, to, to tell, when you tell a story, you're bringing this back to life, you're bringing these characters back to life, and it was considered a very powerful thing to tell a story. It mm-hmm. wasn't just entertainment, it was, it was a kind of magic, so that's why I, I call it a spell break. Um, yeah, and the time. stories are really good. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Uh, <laughs> Now, let's talk a little bit about crafts, because there were two of them that jumped out at me. And um, the first one, it, as I was looking, I, I now want to make an elven inn. Now, what, what's the oh, story okay. behind the inn? Um, well, they probably I just want to say they probably jumped out at you because I had a really great illustrator on this one, Wen Shu. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I, love, I love her. She's illustrated, had illustrated some of my crafts in the in um, the Lowell and Annuals and the Sabbath Almanac. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just said, yeah, I want her. I want her for this book because I, I just <laughs> love her stuff. Um, so that like I have said that you you could make this craft. It's a little it's a little um, a little hut with a round doorway and a pointy roof that you can stick a rib- ribbon on the in the point of the roof and hang it on the Christmas tree or you could stick it um, in the corners of the house. Uh, for there's there's Icelandic stories about elves passing through, usually on New Year's Eve, um, often passing through houses and needing a place to rest, so you could stick it there. And you could tell people that it is an ancient craft and that in the Bronze Age they used to make them out of birch bark. Uh, but that would be a lie, but I think it's a very pretty lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you could make these, you could even make one, because I have the pattern for it in the book, um, mm-hmm. a template. Um, you could blow it up on a photocopier, make it a little bit bigger. You could even make it out of felt. Um, the instructions are for paper because that's I just I think in paper. Um, mm. So it's and you can you can have fun with it. You can paint it the way I've the pattern says, or you can just uh, go wild. And yeah, it's a cute little house. And as I as I think I say in the book, just because it's small doesn't mean that the elves are small. It just means that. Space is not an issue for them. There you go. Yes, it's very magical. Um, good. So, I, yeah, I'm going to do that actually because I think it's really cute, and hope the cat doesn't tear it apart. Send me a picture. I send will. Send me a picture when you. Do. I will. You might laugh really hard. Um, I'm not really a good crafty person, except when it comes to witchcraft. But that's a whole other story. Um, but the the other thing, um, I liked elf stones, and and so. Tell everybody what elf stones are. Um, how do we make them, and for what reason? Um, well, there's there's the elf stones that I that I have you painting in the book for fun, mm-hmm. and you can stick them in the garden. And uh, yeah, somebody just noticed mine in the garden the other day because if yeah, people are noticing mine in the garden um, uh, because I'm you know, entertaining outside, if I see a friend where I'm seeing them outside, not inside. Um, so yeah, it's a good time to make elf stones. So. In the book, I have I've suggested um, patterns. You paint them either black or you paint them white, and then decorate them with a silver marker. And I've I've put there are drawings in there of shapes that are found on the real elf stones um, in northern Europe. Uh, but there are even in um, India there are stones that have uh, footprints pecked into them, just mm-hmm. like. In Northern Europe, I think it's part of the Indo-European, um, you know, cultural heritage. Uh, when you see a, a footprint in a stone, that indicates the presence of a god. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Just like in Asia now, there are a lot of Buddha's footprints everywhere. So mm-hmm. I think at, at one time it would have been Frey's footprints, um, the fertility god Frey. Um, so, and it's funny though. So there's, there's, you could have a bear footprint. But then there's also a, a pair of foot that we see a lot in in Denmark and Sweden. Um, it's two the soles of two feet close together, mm-hmm. and then there's a line across where the arch would be, 
Mm-hmm. And what it probably is is that you have a leather sole cut out, and then you would have had an upper, which, of course, we can't see, and then a thong wrapped around mm. the foot mm-hmm. to hold it together. But it looks like like a pair of hard-soled dress shoes <laughs> um, on the, uh, you know, it's like somebody waiting for a train, so it's kind of funny. Um, so I have that, um, some sun wheels, which as it most, uh, it's most simple is a, a circle and divided into quarters. And if you, if you happen to go to my Facebook page to promote the show, did you see, I posted a picture where I am, was, I took it several years ago, um, I'm posing with what's actually a reproduction of a famous elf stone called the Schallenstein von Bunzel, mm. um, which is in northern Germany. And that has the works on it. It has handprints, which we don't actually have a lot of handprints on stones. Um, and it has the pecked holes. Um, I don't suggest that you actually peck a hole in a stone. You can draw, draw a circle. Um, but a lot of these elf stones have little holes pecked in them, and there's different theories as to why. Um, Some say they were for grinding acorn meal, and we Mm -hmm. do see uh, stones with holes in them in Northern California where um, acorn meal was a a big part of the diet, but those holes are a little bigger. So I'm not, like, those are very small holes for grinding acorns. It would take a long time. Um, Some say it was for... Um, kindling fire in a ritual, like like the need fire at certain times of the year um, when all the fires are put out and then you kindle a new fire and everybody takes takes the embers from that. So there could have been, they could have put, um, you know, tinder, cotton grass or something in that, that hole and then use the bow drill to make a fire in there. Uh, could also have been offerings of... Um, Fat, honey, milk, uh, who knows, maybe blood, uh, ashes of offerings. And uh, less accepted is the idea that these holes represent constellations because nobody's really been able to identify any constellations among these the holes because mm. they're just kind of like usually just scattered um, yeah. over the stone. And there's, there's a cool, there's some cool... Um, Ships um, that they drew on the stones, and um, you know, funky, funky trees. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, you can have a lot of fun with it. You can you can use the basic things and then just kind of kind of go wild with it. Yeah, I think I'm going to do a couple and put them in the garden. Yeah, yeah, they're they're very cool. Um, and and one thing on my show that we never overlook in books are recipes because we all love to eat. And um, you've got some really good ones in the book. Um, I, I, one was I was looking, I can't pronounce it for, to save my soul, but it's a cookie. It's a Christmas cookie, and it starts with an A, and it's got all kinds of... Oh, uh, yeah. The, okay, I don't speak as Icelandic, but to the best of my knowledge, it's Alfrazul. Okay, that'll the, work. That D is a, is a V, um, like the, the T-H in the. Mm. Alfrazul. Um, and it means um, it, it's a, a sort of a, it's a kenning for, for the sun, the glory of mm. the elves. Okay. I mean, it's good. I mean, you know, um, nice butter, sugar, egg, vanilla extract, almond ax- extract, a dash of rum or whiskey or, you know, a little libation. Yeah, that dash um, of rum really makes it, yeah. Yeah, I bet it does. And, and I mean, you know... Um, and not all the recipes are for food, mind you. I mean, you talk about um, oh, where was it? I lost it. Um, <laughs> but, the candles. Oh, oh, the soap too. The birch soap. And soap. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. In, in the Elven Herbal. So there's soap recipes. There's Christmas ornament recipes. There's um, tons of good recipes. Actually, I mean, the the cookie the the cookie recipe. And there's a cookie recipe, and there's a paper ornament recipe, and you're using the same pattern for those. Yeah, yeah, they're called the same thing, and and yes, and there's also this really looks good Christmas rye bread. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's a whole. There's there's a, there are a bunch of stories um, from Scandinavia about the girl who goes to the store storehouse on Christmas Eve or St. Lucy's Eve 
to get some more rye bread and is kidnapped by the elves on the way. Mm. That's the theme. So I thought, got to get, got to get some rye bread in there. So I've always said, um, you know, if you're at IKEA at Christmas time, don't send the teenage girl to the Swede shop to get the rye bread. <laughs> It's good. It's really good. And then, you know, like you have a candelabrum, a ship candelabrum. And I mean, I'm just, you know, going through here. I mean, I picked the ones that came out before, but there's so many things in here that that are really interesting. Um, And, you know, uh, there's one thing, I mean, a lot of interesting bits as we go along um, and things that maybe people haven't really heard of. And one of those things in my case, is elf sickness. Now, I've never heard of that. Could you elaborate on elf sickness? Um, let's see. That's that's. A, I think that was in England. Um, yeah, they had England. They had a fraught relationship with the elves, and um, even though it's a it's a Germanic language, and the you know the first English speakers to come to England were coming from the the German mainland. Uh, they didn't. The dwarves never took off in England. It was it was elves that the Anglo Saxons um, talked about, and yeah, they thought you know there's like elf shot is yeah elf shot in English. It's Hexenschuss or mm. witch shot in German, and it's sciatica. So they ah. went sciatica on the elves. Um, then there was a, like a, a elf water a waterborne elves were. Or, or elves responsible for waterborne diseases, um, but at the same time, so so they saw elves as posing a danger. But at the same time, there's a, a lot of Anglo-Saxon names, and that elf is part of. Mm-hmm. So they had, um, you know, so they were naming their children. They wanted their children to have elvish qualities: elf courage, um, elf gift. Uh, so yeah, they, so it was, they were the elves had admirable qualities. It seemed to be beauty and bravery, but then they were also considered dangerous, and they were they were blamed for disease. Mm. Mm-hmm. That and yeah. Even I, into, you know, after they became Christian, they mm-hmm. were still you know there was a, still um, a strong belief in elves and an admiration for the, for elves. We had bishops, um, English Anglo-Saxon bishops with with elf names. That's very cool. I didn't know that. Um, also, in the book, you have an elven herbal. And so, what are the, some of the plants familiar to the elves or the mound people? Um, well, I went back and to, to see like what would have been, uh, you know, growing there in the Bronze Age because it wasn't all the same things. Like uh, oatmeal is a fairly sort of a newcomer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they had it by the early Middle Ages, but I think it came in like in the in the early Iron Age. Um, birch trees seem to have special significance um, for the elves. They're associated with the dead, and and birch would have been one of the first things um, to af- after the Ice Age to start growing um, in Northern Europe. And so, so at one point it was the only tree in the landscape. And so there's a lot of cool connections of of birch with the dead and, and the dead and the elves. Um, in many ways, the elves are the dead. Uh, we have a an Austrian prince, a Bronze Age prince, who was buried in a, a birch bark hat. Um, hmm. There's a ballad where... Uh, a woman is visited by her three sons who have drowned, and they appear to her they're wearing birch bark hats. And somehow she knows in this this old ballad that she knows that they're dead because they are wearing the birch bark hats. Mm. Wow! And that's even though that's you know thousands of years distant from the Austrian prince. Um, I, I thought that was that was cool. And the reason uh, I have the birch bark soap. Uh, the bir- not birch bark soap, but birch soap, um, mm-hmm. using birch essential oil, is that in Finland, um, you have your, use your birch bark soap um, in the sauna, you know, when you wash up after, and uh, it, the there's a special kind of elf called a sauna tontu who lives in the sauna. Oh, he must be all wrinkly, so huh? You, <laughs> Sorry. 
Well, no, I don't know, Kathy. You, well, you you sweat in the sauna and then you and then you jump in the water. Okay, all right. So yeah, so right. he keeps he can just sit in there sweating as long as he keeps drinking his brandy because uh, they like that too. That's one of his. Um, they all these these elves have to be given gifts at Christmas, and he prefers um, uh, brandy and cigars on Christmas. <laughs> So anyway, I just to suggest that you know, it's, um, if you want to attract a sound on town to maybe keep some birch bark soap in your shower. Yeah, I don't think I've ever smelled birch. I mean, I know certain it would smell like root beer. Oh, yeah, it okay. like root beer. Hmm? All right, because you know, yeah. I, I, we know sandalwood, and we know you know a lot of those things. But oh my God, mm-hmm. that's. That smells nice. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to re reconsider that recipe and, and look for it because it must be really nice. If it smells anything that smells like root beer isn't half bad, honestly. <laughs> so I, I think that would be good. So basically, I mean, there are crafts, there are stories, there are recipes. I mean, there's so much in this book that makes it really, really interesting. And um, time is getting very, very short. So I want to let or want you to let everybody know about where they can find you and information on your books, um, whether Facebook, website, wherever you are, or um, anything else that you have to promote and talk about. Um, let's see. You can see some of the crafts. I post my crafts on um, Instagram. So that's uh, lynda.radish. Um, the books, you can order them directly from Llewellyn.com, from the Llewellyn website. Um, they're on Barnes & Noble, Amazon. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of um, New Age booksellers online that you can get them from. Um, what else? Uh, well, you're easy to find yeah, on my, Facebook. I'm easy to find on Facebook, yeah. Um, but spell your yeah, last so name I'll, because, I'll, yeah, so people might. Okay, so it's it's. Linda with an I, and uh, it's Radish is R-A-E-D-I-S-C-H. There you go. So you easy- said it right. You did. Usually they ask me um, before before I go on, how do you pronounce your last name? And you didn't ask me, and you got it right. I. You know what? I usually ask, but for some reason, oh, but you got it right I, the first time. I thought R-A-E to me is Ray, and Dish is Dish. And I figured you'd correct me if I was wrong, but hey, score one for me. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for having a name that I didn't trip over because I'm, I'm good at that. <laughs> All right, well, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. Really interesting book, really good interview. Um, and come back anytime. You know, you have other books to talk about and other things, so um, you're always welcome. And I want to thank everybody who's listening in both live and and on the podcast as well and until next time everybody blessed be and merry meet again and stay safe Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited.